Why, hello, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On today's episode, we'll take a scroll through our comment section. I'll give feedback on your feedback, rebut your rebuttals, and butcher your last names. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your comment moderator today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> Our first comment is from Damon Plant, who says, Love this channel, and I love you. But some of you didn't love episode 61, Abortion and Thought Experiments. I got two thumbs down. Hurtful. Banjo Mute can perhaps help understand why. He writes, Number two is flawed. Okay, so he's referring to my deductive argument against abortion, which is, one, all human embryos and fetuses are innocent human beings, two, intentionally killing an innocent human being is murder, three, murder is wrong. Therefore, killing a human embryo or fetus is wrong. Banjo disagrees with number two, let's find out why. Intentionally killing an innocent human being is not murder in every case. The person could be brain dead in the hospital and being removed from life support. Human and innocent, not murder. Well, Banjo, I think the answer lies in your comment. You said brain dead. Removing them from life support isn't killing them because they're already dead. Human beings cannot live without their brains, though the ladies on The View give it a good effort. The point is, it's not killing because you can't kill what is already dead, unless you're talking about zombies. Are you talking about zombies? Either way, though, I think premise two stands because zombies are nothing but monstrous reanimated corpses. They're not human beings, and so it's not murder to double tap them. But I don't want to gloss over your point. I think brain dead is a bit extreme. A better argument might be something like a persistent vegetative state. The Terry Schiavo case a few years back, for instance. Massive brain damage, but could breathe on her own, move some, and they removed her feeding tube. Super controversial, and plenty of people did consider it murder. But even in there, there is moral and legal distinction between withholding care and actively snuffing out a life. Refusing medical treatment is different from suicide. And not treating Eating is not the same as euthanasia. The distinction is whether or not the death is naturally caused. Removing them from life support is not the cause of their death. Whatever disease or ailment necessitated life support in the first place is the cause of their death. And that's why we're not culpable. But maybe you'll like this better, Banjo. How about intentionally killing an innocent human being through direct action, which deliberately impedes and ends the natural course of life, is murder? Better? It's a bit long-winded, and unless we're being deliberately obtuse, I think we know what killing is. And let's remember what this was centered on, which was abortion. Again, if we knew with a medical certainty that Terry Schiavo, after nine months on life support, would make a full recovery, then removing her feeding tube would be murder. I'd say that's a no-brainer. Well, that wasn't the only issue Banjo Mute had, though. Quote, a fertilized egg is not a unique being because it can still split into twins. I don't think that follows. That it has the potential to become more than one unique being doesn't detract from its own uniqueness. Identical twins might share the same DNA, but darn it, they're people too. They're individuals with their own hopes and dreams and social security numbers. One unique entity can become two unique entities, but at no point do they ever become the mother. Next comment. Samuel Schufler writes, This is solid content. Enjoy the logical breakdown and presentation. Mix with an appropriate amount of snark. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Samuel. I will try to keep the snark in check. Next comment. Tomlinson101 writes, If I were to guess, AOC probably grew up Catholic. Why didn't she quote the Catholic Church's teachings on abortion rather than the nebulous Jewish thought? Because it would be devastating to her case. No, her, her point was because different religions and different schools of thought within those religions have competing ideas on the issue of ensoulment. Uh, they can be more or less permissive with abortion. So because religions have thoughts on it, we can't have laws restricting it, or it's a violation of freedom of religion. But as we said, that's nonsense. Abortion is not a sacrament or religious practice at all. And permitted is not the same as required. And if AOC really thinks that that's a violation of religious freedom, then she should be working to legalize polygamy, right? Next comment. Ezra Hopkins says, Let me guess Catholic. I'm 
not entirely sure why guest Catholic is hyphenated, but you guess wrong. And frankly, Ezra, it wasn't even a guess good. Literally every video starts off with me saying, I'm Pastor Shane. Now Catholics can and do use the term pastor, but come on, if we're just guessing, you could guess better. Oh shoot, I just went over my snark limit. We are now an inappropriate amount. I'm sorry, Samuel, I failed you. Next comment, Milana Brocht said, this is great. I have no idea why believers have not found you. Well, it's your fault. You guys don't share the videos. Next, Infalcone13 says, Great Jimmy Stewart impression. It was not. Rob S. said, We don't pay tax to NPR. It's supported by donations. NPR has several revenue sources, but it does, in fact, receive taxpayer dollars. Roughly 10% of NPR is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasts, and CPB's budget comes from Congress. NPR has stated, quote, federal funding is essential to public radio service to the American public. And there have been multiple efforts and discussions to defund NPR and CPB, even as recently as 2019. Finally, we'll end with comments from Arthur Rezorik, who went on a comment spree on the episode so Thinking Beyond Doublethink, which I rewatched because, honestly, I'm not quite sure how these comments are connected to the content, but we'll do our best. Arthur says, Applause for this Orwell quote, So maybe scripture is not the only place for worthwhile ideas. Did some people suggest otherwise? Yes, Christians read other books, and, and this is going to blow your mind, Christians even write other books. In fact, I've written several books. No one reads them, but is that why? Guys, it's okay to read other books besides the Bible. Arthur continues, The Chesterton quote, what year was that? Maybe it is my age, not the age. Well, there I go again, reading things that aren't the Bible. But to answer the question, the Chesterton quote was from 1926. Next comment. You, scripture is the foundation of knowledge and understanding. Well, it, it's certainly foundational. But even in theological terms, the Bible is special revelation, not general revelation, which is to say it is a Christian idea that you can have knowledge and understanding even about the subject of God apart from Scripture. Next, Scripture is literal, Scripture is metaphorical, Scripture is both, and I can tell when it is one or the other. Yeah, me too. This feels sarcastic, but it seems unmerited. Of course some of scripture is literal and some is figurative and metaphorical. Everyone believes that. So is the sarcasm because it's ridiculous to think we could tell the difference between figurative and literal? We do that all the time, with every text we've ever read. Let's try it out. Give me some scripture. Uh, you deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Is that metaphor or literal? How would we ever know? It's impossible. Next, science is the basis for a realistic worldview, except when it conflicts with my scripture, then it's not to be trusted. It feels like you're kind of falling into scientism, which is not science and self-refuting. And I don't see any conflict between science and scripture. Next, the Bible as good story is way different from the Bible as, well, scripture. I agree, the authority of scripture is crucial. Next. It seems for you religious testimony is God calling to you to believe after Corinthians. I'm sure there is plenty of testimony in other faiths. How much testimony is required to swallow double talk? Now this comment is connected to the content of the video. However, I think you misunderstood my point. What I was saying was, how do you reach people who will not be persuaded by facts, reason, science, or logic? And the answer was story. Because story is a fictional testimony, but can have the same effect. I'm not suggesting that all testimonies are true, and this isn't some formal argument for God. It's a tactics issue, because you can't really argue against testimonies. I don't believe in ghosts, for instance. I have no factual reason to believe in ghosts, no scientific evidence or data, and no logical basis to believe in ghosts. But if someone tells me about an experience they've had with a ghost, I don't go, no, you didn't have that experience. You're a liar. I go, well, that's weird, and I move on with my day. We don't argue against testimonies, but they can still be very effective in influencing people. You start hearing enough testimonies about ghosts encounters, and you might even start to reconsider, or it'll spur you on to probe deeper to examine the evidence. And that's what I want with Christianity, to get people to reconsider and to spur them on to probe deeper and to examine the evidence, regardless of their ultimate conclusion. Testimonies are effective, and particularly effective, with issues that we haven't really thought through or are agnostic about, which for most people is a lot. Well, we're going to close up our mailbag. 
Thank you, everyone. I mean that. Thank you to everyone who left a comment. Please keep those coming. This was fun. You can reach me on my author's Facebook page. Follow me on the major socials. Like, subscribe, share, rate, review, and I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Thank <laughs> you.